Hello my friends, welcome to my video. Today, me and my friend Darius Stepp. Hello, hello. We will discuss Russian cities and traveling in Russia in general. And first, we want to know the context when this video is being filmed. Today is February of 2023 and it's almost one year of the war with Ukraine that Russia started. And of course, we understand that in such an environment, it uh, would be really strange to like invite people to travel yeah. to Russia or speak about Russia, ignoring all these things. Okay. So yeah, why we want to make this video is to kind of celebrate our memories from Russia because neither me nor Dasha now can go to Russia because we're basically scared. Exactly. All we want is just to share our background mm -hmm. and our history, our kind of childhood and teenager memories with you. So we had a better idea what life was like in Russia before everything what's happening now. As you know, now I reside in Georgia. As for Dasha, she has more plans. <laughs> yeah, just traveling from one place to another. Yes, and recently we went to Batumi in Georgia and this is where we got the inspiration for this video because we were comparing Batumi to different cities that we saw before mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see that me and Dasha have different impressions and comparisons. Batumi, what it was like for you and what you remembered when you look at the city? Actually, it reminded me of Sochi and by the way, it's located not that far away from Batumi, so it was kind of obvious for me. Well, Sochi is the city in Russia or or I would say better, a region of Russia where Olympic Games were held. So now there is a big ski resort there, which was very different from Batumi because it doesn't have it. But the sea coast, quite similar, and the towns and etc. I've never been to Sochi mm -hmm. in, in that south part of Russia. That's why I compared Batumi to Vladivostok. Mm -hmm. Because I'm from the far east. I was born in Primorsky Krai. It is a region like on the very east south of Russia. Vladivostok is the capital. It is a port city. Also, you can see seagulls, of course, ships. But it's interesting how different our impressions were. Actually, the farthest I got in Russia, it was Siberia, where there is a Baikal lake and also outer region. So I've never been in the Far East and I don't have an idea what's really like there. And now let's name all the cities where we both were. I visited, of course, Spask, my hometown in Primorsky Krai, Vladivostok, Khabarovsk, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Veliky Novgorod, Vladimir and Nizhny Novgorod. Mm -hmm. What about you? Okay, I've been in actually many places. I've been in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kazan in Tatarstan. I've been in Siberia, in Irkutsk and ulan uh, I've been in few cities in Altai region. Also, I've been in Murmansk, is the north of cities in Russia. I also visited Karelia region next to Finland and some small towns around it. And I've been in many cities around the golden circle of Moscow and some other towns which I like, I've been to so many places there, so to be honest, I already forgot all the names. You so. forgot Caucasus. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay, and then Caucasus. I've been in all regions of Caucasus, Dagestan, Chechnya, also kabardino balkaria karachayo Cherkessia, and others. So, I travel quite a lot. Wow, <laughs> I'm really impressed because yeah, my city is just like three cities. I think that I traveled in the United States more than in Russia actually, yeah. but is, this is another story. And there are some cities that I visited and you too, mm -hmm. for example, Vladimir. Oh yeah. <laughs> is it in the Golden Ring of Russia? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And my relatives are living there, so I spent all my childhood in the city. Did you like Vladimir? Well, when I was a kid, so basically I was just going to the house of my relatives and I didn't really uh, like explore the city. But a few years ago, I decided, okay, it's time to change it. And actually when I started YouTube, because I mm. wanted to show the city to people. And I was surprised that there was almost nothing to see. Basically, there is just one street with few attractions and you can finish everything in two hours. And actually, that's what I told Natasha about mm. this and she didn't believe me. Yeah, so when I was going to Vladimir, I asked Dasha, like, her impressions, and she said there's just one street. I was like, no, probably this is a joke, there can't be just one street in this city uh, that worth seeing. But actually, yeah, it's true, there's this famous gate of yeah. uh, some knyaz, mm -hmm. and yeah, there is a historical part of the city that goes along this street, but nothing more. And I even went to a district with Khrushchevkas, mm -hmm. like, 
where yeah, people live. My relatives are living. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. And also, I was kind of sad that there is a nice a small river in Vladimir, mm -hmm. really old one, and they don't even have an embankment. And it's because this railroad just next to the river, so they block the river from the city. Maybe there are some possibilities to change it, but of course the Russian government will not yeah. do this. And you know what, what else I was surprised? Vladimir is the part of the golden ring of Russia, and it is considered like the Russian history that you have to visit. And I lived in the Far East. It is a region where everything is deteriorating. People are escaping from the Far East, either to Moscow or abroad, because, well, I saw only despair and sadness. In my comments, people often accuse me of showing only the bad sides of Russia for mm -hmm. purpose. But no, it was literally what I saw be uh, around me. And that's why I had this assumption that maybe cities closer to Moscow will be richer than my mm. region. But I was really unpleasantly surprised to see that Vladimir, it's like two hours by train from Moscow. Yeah, it's quite close. It's really close and it is so poor. Yeah, I'm so sad, exactly, the poverty, like that's what I remember, because I also seen how people live there, how my rel relatives are living there, and I'm like, I'm so sad, because they work so hard, but because of the local salaries, like they can't afford anything, like they even go into Moscow like once in a year, because it's also expensive for them. So when you see this, like I'm looking at Russian cities differently. For you guys from other countries, you might find this quite fascinating. Like authentic, authentic, like wow, yeah. all these shabby Soviet houses. Exactly, but like from my side, I see poverty in this. So mm -hmm. for me, it's quite difficult to travel to such cities. What is the average salary in Vladimir? Okay, so it actually was 200 bucks. It was very low, like one of my cousins, she earns 30,000 rubles, which is like $400, and it's considered to be a very good, a very good salary here yeah. in Vladimir. Well, in my hometown Spask, average, I think it's about 25,000 rubles. Mm -hmm. Our food prices are more expensive than in the European part of Russia, which means that, well, basically it means that people in Russia live poorly. What about Moscow? What is the average salary? There? Okay, so Moscow, it's like so different. For example, one of my closest friends, you know her, she works in the vet clinic and she earns uh, 36,000 rubles, which is $600. She works five days per week for 12 hours non-stop in the clinic. It's very low. I mean, only to get there, like she spent, I think, uh, $150 just for transportation per month. Mm -hmm. And they don't give her food or anything. And by the way, interesting thing that she has a new colleague now who came from a small town, Tula, mm -hmm. and uh, she was surprised how low salary is in Moscow. Mm -hmm. She was like, well, I approximately earned the same in Tula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit less, but I don't spend money for transportation. I, it's like 20 minutes to come to the clinic. And uh, also I have a house there. So she, even in Tula, if you combine all the prices and etc., she was earning more than actually yes. in Moscow. But on the other hand, it can be very different, like maybe $2,000, around 150,000 rubles, mm -hmm. but it's a very, very high salary. Like, it's probably that. only the IT workers who earn this, but now all the IT workers left <laughs> Russia because of mobilization, because of their political position and so on. Yeah, I agree. I think right now, like the average salary in Moscow, I would say, 50, 60,000 rubles, which is like $800 approximately. For Moscow, it's really small. Oh yeah, exactly. For example, if you would like to rent an apartment there, uh, you will pay approximately 40,000 rubles for one bedroom. So if your salary is 60,000 and you pay 40,000 uh, for your accommodation, like, I mean, you only have money for food and transportation, that's it. That's why actually many Russians, they don't save money. They don't have yeah. any money for like, Black Day were called like that. This is something to consider. Let's discuss other towns of the Golden Ring. I actually really like Kolomna. Mm. It's a very, very small town. When I was walking there, it felt for me like I was in the past, actually. So it was very atmospheric for like the half of day there. I think it's perfect. Another town which I like was Tula because actually they did some renovations for its embankment. It was very enjoyable to walk there. Also, they made a wall with some historical people. So it was very interesting for me to take a look at this. But to be honest, Natasha, overall, like when I was traveling uh, in the towns of 
Russia, they all seem more or less the same for me because mm. obviously there is a church, probably Kremlin, all the houses are approximately the same. The only actually city which I like was in Tatarstan, it's Kazan. Oh my god, guys, it was such a great combination of churches and also mosque. There is a gorgeous mosque just in the middle of the city, right next to its Kremlin. I really liked that because it was finally something new and interesting for me. And another city which I really liked was Ulan Ude because I'm actually a very big fan of Buddhism. And in Ulan Ude you could see some Buddhist temples which is also very different from what I'm used to and that's why I also like it. And another fun thing about Ulan Ude, which actually makes the city so unique, it's a huge, giant head of Lenin in the main square of the city. When I saw this, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? I also saw the statue of Lenin in Veliki Novgorod. Mm -hmm. In that great historical city, they placed it there. And okay, this is the part of Soviet history, but... Yeah, not no. a fan. <laughs> So you mentioned Kremlin and you said that in every city they have Kremlin and okay. we actually discussed it before and Dasha was surprised to learn that in Khabarovsk and in Vladivostok we don't have a Kremlin. Oh my god, it's like total shame of me guys because I honestly so used to Kremlins that I was thinking they in all around Russia which is actually wrong. And on the contrary for me it was so funny to even think about the possibility if we had a Kremlin in Khabarovsk, mm -hmm. because what is Kremlin? It is a word for an old fortress mm -hmm. that was surrounding the ancient Russian cities in like medieval times. And in my childhood, I thought that there's only one Kremlin in Moscow. <laughs> yeah, but now I know that there is Kremlin in Tula, right? Tula, Yaroslav. Yaroslavl. I also know that Tobolsk, Pskov, mm -hmm. and Astrakhan. Probably the last one was built in Kazan. It uh, dates back to the Russian history when Ivan the Terrible was conquering territories to the east and he achieved Kazan. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that when they started to conquer Siberia, there were fortresses and maybe yeah. some of them did not remain to our days. When I was a kid, we had some tours to Kremlin and everywhere. So since my childhood, I've seen Kremlins everywhere. Mm -hmm. But it's not. You live, you learn every day. <laughs> yeah, and also it's interesting that our cities in the Far East are so young. That's mm -hmm. why, that's another yeah. thing why we would not have a Kremlin. Because, well, I remember that Spask was founded in the year of Coca-Cola Company Foundation. Oh my god. Yes, it is a very young city compared yeah. to the other part of Russia. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, discussing age of the cities is a big issue because in Russia we even have a holiday, which is called the city day or yeah. the birthday of the city. And normally it is celebrated every year. So when I was a child in Spask, we basically had only two celebrations that gathered all the people and that the city administration uh, gave money for so it was the city day and the 9th of may of course mm -hmm. but that's another story yeah we will not discuss it yeah we will not discuss it and also comes a mosque on amur is uh, even younger it was built in the 30s of the 20th century so we have young cities that's crazy for me to think about that because okay so when moscow was built i think 1147 by yuri dogaruki and it's like almost a thousand years and most other cities in my region they're that old and even older so when natasha mm -hmm. is telling me that their cities is like 100 years old and like Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> One more city that we both visited is Nizhny Novgorod. What do you think about it? Yes, I think I like the city a little bit more than some others, for example, the Golden Circle, but again, I'm not a fan. Like, there is just nothing so special for me there. Of course, history, but all Russian cities in this region, like they're very historical. So again, churches, Kremlin, similar, like one walking street there. The only thing that I liked, I think, at Beckman, the Rio was huge and I think it was built quite lovely. I was there for a music festival, so I didn't spend that much time in the city, which mm -hmm. was good because I think I would get bored. I would say for one day trip, it's fine, but I wouldn't like to stay there longer. What's actually very interesting because many people from Russia who are not from Moscow, they really like the city. And they were telling me, oh, such architecture, atmosphere. But maybe, for example, if you would come who were born in a completely different environment and cities and culture, you might find this fascinating. Well, as for myself, who were born in Moscow, mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, 
okay big Let city girl oh yeah mm. big city girl you know all these we these stereotypes jokes. yeah we have jokes in rush about moscowites that they think too much about themselves and every other city is bad for them and etc and just i don't know what else you tell me i also had the stereotype i thought that people in moscow are richer that mm -hmm. they have more money which is maybe true because your salaries are higher but it doesn't mean that people in moscow live better because also the prices are higher mm -hmm. and i thought that people there they are like rich they can go abroad but when i met you and you told me your story i realized that it was all stereotypes for example dasha told me that like her school was one of the worst in the in the <laughs> district while i thought that yeah. wow all schools in moscow uh, with good teachers with good english education oh yeah so oh yeah i think we had absolutely the same because we were discussing schools and we we're like oh okay all problems are absolutely the same in all parts of russia yeah maybe there are some good schools in moscow but i was going to the simplest one next to my house and it, it's actually by the rates it was the worst school ever we had some people taking cocaine in the toilet smoking or sorry spitting on the class and that's why i think it's uh, all the same in russia we would probably be ready to make another video about <laughs> yes. that and discuss our traumas but let's return <laughs> to uh, districts of moscow yes and worth to say that yes i'm traveling a lot but i'm the only one from all my friends circle who traveled that much because i'm just spending all my money for traveling like without buying much stuff to myself uh it's not normal for a typical mm. moscow to travel that much I also wanted to add about Nizhny Novgorod. Mm -hmm. I went there one year ago and I made a video about that on my channel. It was interesting for me to learn about the city because I'm not a local and I purposely read Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that at school, you know, Russia is very centralized. So at history lessons, we learned only about Moscow. So all the history of Russia was like taking place in Moscow. I mean, all the decisions were mm -hmm. taken in Moscow. It was interesting to read how events of the Russian history were reflected not only in Moscow, but in mm -hmm. Nizhny Novgorod, which was considered probably a province city uh, back then, like in the 19th century in Moscow. Also, they have some famous people like Maxim Gorky, mm -hmm. the Russian writer, was born there. Even in the Soviet time, the city was called after him, Gorky. You know, the Soviets really like to give yes. ugly names to oh, cities. Yeah. What else? Awesome. Uh, St. Petersburg was named uh, Leningrad, yeah. Volgograd was Stalingrad, mm -hmm. and as I said, living in the Far East, I thought that, okay, I live in poor conditions here in the Far East, nothing is developing, but probably the closer to Moscow, mm -hmm. the better. So. I was expecting that cities like around Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod, again, it is really close. It's like four hours by the fast train from mm -hmm. Moscow to Nizhny Novgorod. In my measures, it is fast. I expected it to be like, like Moscow, but smaller mm -hmm. with the same nice service. But what I realized that is Nizhny Novgorod is like another Khabarovsk gray buildings 80 years old buses <laughs> and it is so sad yes i think this is what a mistake everybody from the forest and from siberia are doing it's no matter how close the town from the moscow it it doesn't improve the living conditions anyhow i think the cities that are quite developed and unusual and unique is moscow st petersburg and i would say kazan because yes. it's a big cities they're different between each other great service and also look very interesting and many things to do there yeah i would add about kazan is because they have their own oil mm -hmm. and they are trying to be more independent because you know tatarstan was basically conquered by russia like many yes. years ago and now they have their own president and his title is president even though recently the the russian government like the one in moscow changed this title mm -hmm. from president to something else to raise by this you can see how moscow is trying to uh, suppress the independence of other region their self um, self uh, identity yes exactly well what about the forest the cities there well basically it's like another nizhny novgorod mm -hmm. but just surrounded mm -hmm. by forests okay. because you know far east is a really huge territory it is like one third of the whole russian territory and it's not densely populated like mm -hmm. the western parts of russia yeah so khabarovsk is a city with six 
100,000 population. Mm -hmm. Vladivostok is the same. Both of them are located on different sides of the last segment of the Trans-Siberian Railway. And they mm -hmm. made a video about this, how I was going mm -hmm. from Khabarovsk to, well, not Vladivostok, but Spass, but it's close. So the train from Khabarovsk to Vladivostok will take you 13 hours. And for me, it's fast. Wow, <laughs> we have like with you completely different ideas of how fast the train is. Yeah. Yeah. For example, we've been just flying to Uzbekistan and it was three hours flight. Okay, well, not that short, but okay, flight. And Natasha was like, oh my God, that, that was so fast. I'm like, oh, really? Yes, because when I was flying from Khabarovsk to Moscow, it took me eight hours by plane. And children in Spask have only two ways, well, three, either to marry at the age of 18, they like, give birth to like 30 children, or to go to Vladivostok to study in mm -hmm. college or to Khabarovsk. Well, the smartest or the richest go to Moscow. It would be logical for me to go to Vladivostok, but I went to study to Khabarovsk. Later, I regretted that because, in my opinion, Vladivostok is more developed. It is a port city and the pace of the city is different because people are moving faster and it is a very hilly city. And, well, the drawbacks <laughs> is that there are always traffic jams, mm -hmm. many cars, only Japanese cars because Vladivostok is close to Japan. And yeah, it's very unique. Yes, Natasha, you are like saying so much interesting things about Vladivostok and I really, really wanted to visit it. I badly wanted to explore the forest of Russia. And Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore, like maybe in 10 years. And actually, before the war started last year, I was thinking I'm gonna take a Trans-Siberian train to Vladivostok and we're gonna meet there last summer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it will feel for me because I'm not a huge fan of trains, mm -hmm. but I think once in a lifetime you must do that. Actually, when I've been studying in England, uh, I had a teacher who did a Trans-Siberian and mm -hmm. he said he was shocked. He was like, I came there, there were Russian group of men who invited him and they just been drinking vodka every day for seven days in a row. He was like, in three days, I already could understand nothing. Where I am, what I'm doing with who I am. But he started to understand the Russian <laughs> because of vodka. <laughs> no, he said it was a lifetime experience, but he would never try this again. You should watch our channels and uh, stay with us for another 10 years yes. to see. And in 10 years, when the Russia is free, Natasha and I are going to take a Trans-Siberian tr railway. Or maybe we will try one from Moscow and you will try one from the Far East. And we're gonna meet someone in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> That's nice. gonna be fun. Also, when I'm thinking about the Far East, it's very fascinating for me to imagine that actually China and Japan are so close because for people from Moscow, these countries are so far away and usually no one is going there. But my mom was a flight attendant and she'd been visiting China for so many times. And I remember she was bringing so much stuff from there because we've been living very, very poor when I was a little girl and we didn't have money or anything to buy there in Moscow. So for me, China, I don't know, it's so interesting. And when Natasha was telling me that, oh, she's been a few times in China, I'm like, wow, China, <laughs> you've been in China? That's so cool. And you have absolutely different feelings about that. Idea. Yeah, well, the way I went to China, I don't know, it was not illegal, but I will tell the story. Mm -hmm. So for us in Primorsky Krai, it is really easy. It's like eight hours by bus to go to China. And why we go there, basically for shopping, mm -hmm. because there is a town called Suifanghe. And in the 90s, it was just a village. But for 20 years, it developed to a very densely populated mm -hmm. city. And basically the whole city looks like a market for us. And it's so funny, it is such a meme. You can see shop names both in Russian and Chinese, but if they are in Russian, oh my god, they are called like Natasha Dasha Fur Coats or Dima T. So basically, they take the name of the person and some item. It is so funny. Sometimes they make mistakes. Like, I mean, it can seem quite atmospheric, authentic, you know, that scene, all this stuff. And when I went there, I was a teen. I was first 12 and then 14. I went there with my mom for like three days and we ate all this tasty food, even though I think it was really. Uh, adapted for Russians. Mm -hmm. Yes, we bought these cheap clothes and actually when we went back there was some interesting thing because we went there as a tourist group. So basically because the uh, voucher to go to China was so cheap or even free for us, I don't remember. Free? You could go to China for free? You could go to China for free, but then on your way back you have to ah, carry heavy 
bowls, bags with clothes when you're going back to Primorsky Krai. And at the customs, they would ask you, what is that? And they open all your big bags with all the items that you see for the first time. And you have to say, oh, this is for my aunt, this is for my brother, my <laughs> relatives. So what we, were, so what we were doing, we were just helping a merchant who was avoiding like taxes mm -hmm. that you have to pay when you're transferring goods from through the border. Mm -hmm. So we were pretending that these were ours big bags mm -hmm. and that's how I remember that uh, for each person had to carry about 50 kilograms yes 50 yes 50 no. five zero five zero yes Kilogram. yes how could you bring it like that you've been tiny yeah that. so well actually what we did my mom paid for my voucher but she still had to carry that so I helped her a little <laughs> this is how we traveled. But then, actually, in 2014, it became unprofitable for Russians mm. to go to China because the Chinese currency yuan before was equal to just 4 rubles mm -hmm. and after 2014 it was equal to 10 rubles and it mm. basically became unprofitable for us. Gotcha. And what happened back then? Well, we all know what happened in 2014. Yeah, and it's interesting that when I was a child, I didn't even realize it. And it seems that my mom do even doesn't realize it. She doesn't understand that it's connected to Crimea mm -hmm. and the sanctions. Also, if I'm not mistaken, the dollar also became expensive for Russians. Twice, twice more. Yes, so before 2014, one dollar was equal to 30 rubles. 30 rubles. After that, it rose to 70 and now it's still there. Yeah, and I mean, it's go, it went very up. Then it went down for like 60 year, rubles, rubles and then it was growing like years by year. But then approximately it became 70 rubles, which was for a few years like that. Well, no. How to become Russian in a few seconds. <laughs> well, Natasha, I would say that actually Moscow is also don't really connect uh, the Crimea crisis with the increase in currency. Mm. Uh, I remember 2014, I was 15 years old, I was telling mama, let's buy dollars, <laughs> let's buy dollars. She was like, no, it, it became 40 at that point. She was like, oh, it will return back. Well, mama. I was right at 15 years yeah. old. Yeah, so for me, China was not a Chinese wall and I did not see all these big cities. I saw only that part. That was how I traveled to China. But as for Japan and South Korea, people often think that it is really easy for us, especially foreigners. They think that I go to Japan on ferry or to South Korea and I am so upset and even sometimes pissed off because it's not like this. Our people are so poor. We live literally one hour flight from Japan in Vladivostok, for example. But only probably like 3% of our population of the, of the Primorsky Krai travel there. I think even because, less. Yeah, because, well, first you need a visa to Japan and South Korea. And also it is just expensive. That's what I'm always explaining both to Moscovites and foreigners that know Life in Primorsky Krai is like another poor Siberian village or even Vladimir or Nizhny Novgorod. I think if Russia was more democratic and open to other countries, we would have connections. Yes. But no, I've never been to Japan and... I mean, I can't understand this because Moscow is also located to some European cities and almost no one is visiting them. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's expensive. I think even in for Far East people, it's even more pricey to go to Japan or South Korea or China. Uh, maybe China not that much, but Japan and South Korea. But for Moscow, it's also very expensive to go to Europe. Again, you need a visa, it's difficult to apply, it also costs money. So yeah, I have, I have an idea like what's like there. Well, we discussed the cities where we both visited, but I've never been to the south part of Russia and the Caucasus. Yes. Can you share this? Okay, so this is completely different Russia because in Chechnya, Dagestan, I mean, something that you are not used to in the Far East or in Moscow and its region. Uh, so it's Muslim countries. Um, countries? Countries. 
maybe one day <laughs> well it's muslim region so you can see that a lot of mosques and also for example we had kremlins in the part of russia where moscow is located there you had some towers which you can see actually in the mountains it's usually one of few towers which is located there and it was also for the protection purposes built but the nature there is so fascinating like the mountains food is actually very different and also the region is not that big comparing to all russian regions but if you travel from one place to another the mountains are different the food is already different people and also cultures because for example northern Ossetia they're not Muslim while Dagestan and Chechnya they're Muslim so you can also see a big combination of cultures oh my god that's so interesting and many people are telling me that it's actually dangerous for women to travel there uh, I felt okay but every time worth to say I was with some guys so I wasn't female trail so female show there but I love it Natasha I think one day in 10 years you should come to visit the city is to be honest nothing so special I would say I didn't spend much time in their cities but I did explore the region some mountain places or lakes oh my gosh it was so nice what you were describing now really reminded me of Georgia you said mm -hmm. the mountains not so much space great food and I just realized that like Dagestan or some other republics of the Caucasus they're really more like Georgia than yes. the rest of Russia yes yeah exactly absolutely right and actually if you take a look on the map they're locating quite close to mm -hmm. each other so yeah it's quite similar to Georgia and as you said even though this region is so close to each other but they're so different I don't know how many different peoples and languages and different foods and for me because again living in the Far East where there are big spaces I thought mm. that countries and regions that are close to each other they're basically the same mm. but you said that like in Kabardino Balkaria there are one type of mountains then in Dagestan there are maybe there are lower or something like this yes and also about the level of education and behavior for men for example mm. if you travel to North of Syria, uh, people there are quite educated you had a very nice conversation and it feels for you like okay you're in more or less developed place but for example when you travel to Ingushetia people they are so conservative and close-minded women there like are not people actually like it's just women and there is men people so there by the way I didn't feel so much comfortable and some friends of mine told that some of their men just got drunk in Gushetian men mm -hmm. and try to go to Russian girls like this is crazy uh, but in the other regions you won't see it like that and also speaking about the environment and the garbage for example I've been in Dagestan I've been traveling in the mountains there and there was so much garbage that I was so shocked very unpleasantly but when I was traveling around Chechnya it was very clean well I think that the stricter the regime is the less there are trash in the yeah. streets and the less criminals there are yeah. because maybe all the crimes are happening somewhere underground or in the government you know yeah we are not yeah. going to tell about this yeah story. because we oh, no, no. we really value our lives mm -hmm. and I think we should know that region of the North Caucasus are really dependent on Russia in terms of money I don't know why maybe to keep them loyal to the center of Russia, I mean, to Moscow. But uh, I wish this region could be more independent, could develop tourism uh, and be more like for themselves, not for Moscow. Yeah. But if I say something more by the Russian criminal code, it would be considered a crime because then I would call to mm -hmm. the separatism. Because in Russia, if you say, for example, I wish Primorsky Krai would be a separate country. You can go to jail because it's like you want to mm. you facilitate the separatism oh my gosh i didn't know about that it's that strict to be honest but if we already start talking about caucasus i think if you are traveling there it's not really about traveling to the cities itself because i didn't like it that much but the nature ancient view just there oh my gosh i remember some super asian village in chechnya mountains it was amazing and very i mean you get this vibe of some that you are in asian times and i remember when we were discussing kamchatka oh, yeah. Uh, yeah you said that <laughs> what is more what is more attractive about kamchatka for you oh my god ocean i would like to serve that i know i tried before but i will do it no matter doesn't matter how cold the water is mm -hmm. i will do it black sand 
gorgeous volcanoes. I really want to take a helicopter trip because it's the only way to explore this region uh, and to explore some volcanoes there. And also there are some few days hiking trail to the volcano on the top of this. I also want to take it. And yeah, maybe a tweet career. Dasha was so inspired about Kamchatka so that our camera just died and now we are filming with another phone and the color mm -hmm. is different but yeah but at the same time you have a huge experience of traveling in Europe like mm -hmm. how many countries 20 you visited uh, in Europe I don't know maybe more <laughs> when you go to Europe well not anymore <laughs> uh, I hope you will get I hope so I hope uh, so don't story. tell me don't freak okay. me out <laughs> yeah but when you were in Europe uh, did you like only the nature or you like like the city more Actually, 50 50. And if Russia, I like 90% nature and then 10% cities, here it's absolutely 50 50. Because mm. European cities, you know, they're so cozy, comfortable, uh, interesting, and unusual. For example, in even if you take Italy, like Milan and the North Park, is so different from the South. But in Russia, you can't say it that much because more or less it looks the same. Soviet Russia. Yeah, that's why I like Ulan Ude in Russia because mm -hmm. it was different. That's like I like Kazan. It was different. And also, I think why I don't like traveling in the cities in Russia because again, I see poverty. Like I'm, mm -hmm. like I want to cry. I'm, I'm sad for people because I've seen how people live there. But you don't have these feelings when you're traveling in the European, even small towns, because you already can understand that probably level of life there is way, way higher than somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Russia. So that's the thing, Natasha. When I'm traveling in Europe, I don't feel so sad for people. That mm -hmm. destroys my impression, like I'm traveling in the Russian towns. Yeah, I've never been to Europe still, but I saw videos from European villages and I was like, wow, Village <laughs> is not always a destroyed, yeah. forgotten place with shabby houses and Great houses one, and one cow and one drain cart who beats his wife and mother. Maybe for people in Europe, in, uh, in, in general, let's say in the mm -hmm. Western world, our life in Russia is aesthetic. But yeah. if you live there in this nine storied Khrushchev. Oh, I hate this. I was born in such a place. It's like I'm seeing this from my nightmares that I will continue living in this when I'm older. It's super hot in summer and also when it's raining sometimes it's getting water into the house. Like yeah, it's like I literally once I cried when I woke up because I had a dream that I was growing my family in this place. So yeah, like you, you're right. Like you guys, when you're traveling to Russian cities, you found this authentic, very unusual from the place where you live, but what everything I could think of is how actually poor the people, they're not really smart, they're probably not that happy as they could be. Sometimes I get comments when I speak badly about all these Khrushchevkas, but at least this is affordable housing that people can afford. <sighs> People yeah, can afford nothing. I'm so sorry. Like th I'm getting so emotional after these comments. Like I can imagine you too. too. Like people live super poorly in Russia. They can't afford almost anything. Like these are poor apartments are being transferred from mother to daughter to granddaughter and etc. Because people can afford nothing else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people take huge mortgages oh, yeah. that they pay out for 30 years just for like one bedroom apartment in Khrushchevka. Yes. I know that in the United States, let's say, people also take mortgages, but the percentage, like the interest is way slower. Uh, I think three times lower. And you actually get a in real house. house. Yeah. Yeah. While in Russia, you. So what I would like to answer to such people who say that yeah, but at least it's affordable mm -hmm. and just simple. You know that if there was a better environment and regime in Russia, if people had more money, they maybe would demand houses like in Europe, like in, in Scandinavian Norway, yeah. countries. You know, they are also building multi-store apartment buildings, but the maximum is like uh, five, five floors. Five floors. Yeah. Yeah, and they look six. much better than Russian ones. Yeah, and in Russia, what they're doing now still building and houses. Yeah, and no infrastructure. Yeah, so what I want to answer to the people that actually it's not affordable, it's not like simple, blah, 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 minimalistic. No, it's just poor. Let's talk on maybe how it can be improved. Yeah, like I was trying to promote tourism in my country before the war. Obviously, right now it's not the time. How the country 
thank to you for this? Mm, yes, well, uh, let's not think about that. But uh, I noticed that there are not so many names of streets and etc. doubled in English. And I think it can be a big problem for tourists, uh, worth to say. By the way, in Chechnya and like the Grozny, the main city there, it's actually doubled in English. I was, mm. I was but so why? surprised, unexpected. It's, it's probably the place where foreign people are Don't scared really the go. most yes. to go. Yes, but well, this is the fact. And if more and more cities would like the streets there were doubled in English, and also when you're riding a bus, they will be also pronouncing the streets in English, which they don't do now. Natasha and I really fish that when our country is free, the governments, the new governments, will start to develop in the cities and also their cultural identity. Natasha, could you please share your impressions about this? Yes, I wanted to say that there is no city code or culture also, code yeah of the city because for this you need to hire urbanists architects mm -hmm. what is so unique about our place exactly and how we can attract foreigners yes you know when i was growing up in uh, primorsky Krai in spask i was seeing only this gray buildings around me but once i read some literature about developing of our region and i realized wow we have such unique uh, nature animals like the mm -hmm. amur tiger wow it is so interesting why nobody is talking about this mm -hmm. the only thing i see is moscow on the tv and that's it and i was so sad probably that's when i started to ask questions to the mm -hmm. government like why they're not doing something to improve because they only send money to the wars because you know russia is a commodity economy they just take gold oil and gas they don't care about improving their so-called human capital so they don't even care that us young and smart russian people leave the country they don't need such people yes. like we well i think that city's development is not the most important thing that the russian government will have to think about when uh, the russian government will become democratic mm -hmm. i hope we don't know when it will happen in 10 years mm -hmm. in 20 years but the first thing they will have to do is to um, pay reparations yeah pay reparations to ukraine to correct all their mistakes that they did and only then things will start change i mean in russia yes. and in russian cities and tourism will flow to russia and to well i don't know it's difficult to talk about tourism right now like i can't really imagine it at the moment but hopefully in 30 years when everything gonna change 30 years uh, oh my god people we, in the western yes. country they're like what are they talking about it's like the yes. whole life yeah exactly well the level of this poverty will decrease and more people will have money and at least some normal standard of living yes well, that's it. We hope that you enjoyed our conversation. Because we really enjoyed discussing it, to yeah. be honest. So, subscribe to Dasha's channel, Dari Step. She makes great videos. So, Dasha, now when you are going to your next destination, what your videos are going to be about? Well, first of all, there are going to be videos, small videos about Georgia, then videos from Uzbekistan, yeah. then I will show you a little bit of my life in Russia because I need it for my, because of family issues, I need to come back. Mm. Hopefully, not going to jail there. I will post this video <laughs> probably after you. Yeah, so it. probably you will see this. Then it's actually there are two two choices what i will do i will try to get the schengen visa and to move to one city in europe which i actually very interested in and i had quite an interesting story there mm -hmm. uh, or if i'm not getting schengen visa i'm going to move to asia and travel from country to country well guys that's it thank you so much for watching yes thank you goodbye пока пока, пока, -пока.